Okay, we're back. We're live for the four o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is the Global Report. And Lily Yang is not available today, but I'm here. And uh, her guest, Bill Borum, is here. He joins us from, let's see, where are you? Are you California, in California? The country. Yeah, well, okay. It could be Singapore, it could be California, it could be anywhere. <laughs> and we will talk about everywhere because our show today deals with maritime choke points. You haven't heard that term very much, but you're going to hear plenty about choke points in global trading. Why should we be concerned? We should all be concerned. Uh, and Bill is an international, um, may I say, an international observer. Uh, and That's correct. And plenty familiar with this. He citizen diplomat. Okay. <laughs> citizen diplomat. I want to be that too when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> So, Bill, you know, you say choke points. Let's define our terms. What what is a choke point in international in maritime global trading? Well, in maritime in a maritime sense, you know, it's a narrow passageway of water, of which there are a number, depending on how you count them, around the world. So it's uh, it's a place where uh, some other state actor or non-state actor could do something to choke off. The passage of ships. That's serious. And I guess I, my gut is it's serious, and I know it's serious, but why don't you tell us why it's serious? Well, I think as we um, saw most recently with the Suez Canal, there were all these ships backed up sometimes, I think, and maybe as many as 450 to 500 ships waiting to enter the canal. So what you know, there were goods on those ships. There was uh, petroleum and there's natural gas, a variety of products, and we can talk about that. But uh, something had prevented these ships in their normal course, you know, moving to markets to make their deliveries. And uh, there was some; it almost uh, caused some pain, uh, but fortunately, it really didn't. It was a lot of concern. But there are uh, there are concerns about these choke points, because we could see even in that case, um, the despite, if you want to call it pilot error, uh, it was uh, what they say, it looks like the ship was grounded by strong winds, very strong winds uh, against its superstructure, you know, all those containers. But to go to, go to the point about um, why we should be concerned just for one other thing, and that is this, you know, people, I think they have the impression that, you know, Suez Canal, this ship, what was the, uh, the uh, ever, 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 ever given, ever given was the name of the ship. Right. Huge ship, quarter mile long, that ship. Um, they have the feeling that um, what's happening on the ever given really it doesn't affect them. And that it's far away. It's, it's weeks and months away. And it's not carrying anything that affects them. So. You know, it's distant. They don't need to worry about it. But that's not really true, is it? Yeah, it's there not true. That... Yeah, go ahead. It's not true because actually uh, most of the cargo through the Suez Canal is food, believe it or not, by percentage of uh, tonnage as well as a percentage of uh, value going through there, uh, destined for Europe and other places. So that's a very, very important food. And if it had gone on longer, there, there could have been, uh, you know, problems. Uh, looking back a number of years ago to a problem with the Bosphorus, you know, that's part of, that's there in Istanbul, they call it the Straits of Turkey. And there was a, uh, a problem with ships getting through there and it delayed the, uh, the wheat coming down from uh, Russia. And that affected Africa and caused uh, riots actually in certain African countries. So that's kind of an example about that. But, you know, I was thinking about this uh, a little bit more analytically, and, and we'll get into the physical issues and security and all of that. But uh, and from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, manufacturing companies uh, long have practiced what's called just-in-time inventory, which means they don't want to have a lot of inventory around. They're delivering to order, you know, almost completely. And you've got uh, like a company I used to work for years ago called SAS. And that company has a supply chain solution, which helps producers and uh, anyone in the supply chain from maximizing profit 
reducing cost and reducing inventory. So we're, we're not long from you know, running out of whatever it is, whether it's food or energy supplies. So we're worried about disruption is what we're worried about. Yeah, and uh, sooner, probably sooner than later, um, that disruption will have an effect on all the goods and services we need. Uh, furthermore, the number of ships that are this big, quarter mile long, carrying 20,000 containers, um, that has an effect on so many countries, so many industries, so many people. And, um, you know, you take one ship like that offline and you're affecting effectively millions of people and thousands of um, industrial enterprises and so forth. So we live on a wire. You know, I agree with you totally about the supply chain, just in time for everything, everybody around the world. Avoid the investment in inventory that doesn't move. Make it move right away. Right. Well, of course, uh, the, uh, those um, ships that couldn't get in got through there pretty quickly in a matter of a few days. So I think something should be said about the administration of the canal. They did a good job. We kind of focused on the, the mishap, the incident, and that's under investigation. Who knows when they'll figure that out. But um, I would say something about the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. Each of them have been improved in recent years to accommodate these big ships. You know, they've been widened where they've needed to be widened and also so that you can have ships passing each other. So that's a very positive development. That's uh, an old, you know, that's a part of a solution in effect. But if the, uh, the canal itself is completely blocked, then it doesn't matter how wide it is. But I think there's some efficiency is built in. Uh, so uh, again, both uh, the Republic of Panama and the Arab Republic of Egypt, you know, wants to accommodate world trade and commerce from a safety and security standpoint. Well, you know, it's, it's also a matter of um, it's a matter of money. And my understanding is that for every ship that passes through the Suez Canal, the the fee to the uh, Suez uh, Canal Authority is something around seven hundred thousand dollars for every single ship. Right. Uh, this is a, a a big industry as far as uh, the government of Egypt is concerned. Yes, I think it may only represent a couple of percent of the GDP of, of Egypt, but it is expensive. And th that's a critical issue here when you talk about the transportation and that's uh, starting to push people to find shorter ways. Uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the canals were a shorter way to get from one marketplace to another, but there is an expense associated with it. And we can get into that uh, and the advantage is that, I mean, if the canal is going to be blocked longer, so, some ships are going to have to go down around Africa. That would be a lot longer trip. Yeah. Well, can you, can you go through some of these? I mean, uh, you, you mentioned before the show that there were seven of interest. Uh, and we tick off the ones that I know, but I don't think I know seven. Uh, there's the Malacca Strait uh, near Singapore, the Panama Canal, Suez Canal. You mentioned to me Bob El Mandab, which is south of Suez. I had no idea about that. And now, uh, as you mentioned also to me, the Arctic passages, which are free of ice because of climate change, right. and they're you know they're new shipping routes. So although it's a sad origin, it, the fact is they're shipping routes, and they're not necessarily controlled by the United States, possibly Russia, possibly China. Right. Well, we'll uh, go on to that briefly because that um, illustrates a couple of the points here. You know, with the Arctic ice melting, it used to be that you'd be lucky if you could transit uh, the northern Russian coast for maybe two months a year. But now it looks like it could be almost any time. Uh, Russia has also invested in a new and a number of nuclear powered icebreakers. So they can break up the ice or when emergencies occur, they can be there. So that's a, a passageway, which is much, much shorter than going from China, you know, through the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, and up through the canal, 
and through the Mediterranean up to say Rotterdam. So, uh, so the Northern Sea Route is what it is called. And uh, that does promise a far shorter route. And whether they're gonna able to, uh, be able to charge any tariffs going through there or fees, I'm gonna be talking to an expert at a Russian university next week to probe into that more deeply. But there's no question that one of the first places that came to mind with the Suez problem was looking closely at the Northern Sea Route. Now, what's interesting, you know, we had a, uh, we had the Commandant of the Coast Guard on the show um, a year ago, maybe less. And he spoke of an incident in the Northern Sea Route where the, the Russian Navy uh, had issued a directive um, to the American Navy uh, that uh, if they wanted to use the Northern Sea Route, if they wanted to use the passage that had opened up and what the Russians were claiming, they're claiming it, you know, they should ask permission. And they wanted, uh, you know, advance notice and permission from the American Navy. You can imagine what kind of response they got from the American Navy. Uh, but the point is that- Well, it, it, yeah, it, but it probably did, uh, does transit their territorial waters. And whether this is 30 miles out or 200 miles, so that's gonna have to be adjudicated uh, somewhere by somebody mm -hmm. or mutual mm -hmm. consent. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, you know, Russia's in a position to control that, no doubt about it. Yeah, and, and you know, so that uh, I think we're behind the eight ball and that's simply because they were there when it opened up uh, and they are making their claims even before we make any claims. And, and they have, of course, a nuclear uh, icebreaker uh, that, that has an advantage over uh, a non-nuclear icebreaker. So um, we may find that it's sort of like the Suez Canal, right? Where you have one entity who controls the passage. Exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting we're having this conversation today because uh, over the weekend, the Financial Times of London devoted almost a full page to reviewing uh, three new books about the influence of rivers, oceans, and terrain on the history and strategy of countries. Seems kind of obvious when you stop and think about it, but there, there was a great big uh, a full page book review in the weekend edition of the Times. So uh, it is quite relevant uh, to a lot of people. You know, I think we might uh, spend a little bit more time at the uh, Bob L. Um, at the Strait there, uh, south of Suez Canal. Bob L. Mandab. Bob yeah. L. Mandab. Yeah. I wrote an article about that four years ago, which I published on LinkedIn, because I had uh, just by accident discovered what was going on there. What was going on was uh, China was beginning to build its very first base outside of China. And the US already was there. In fact, the, the only base that the US has uh, there uh, at that strait, and it's actually in the Republic of Djibouti, only uh, 900,000 people in that country. Which is on the east, the east side of Africa, Djibouti. It is, it's in the yeah. uh, Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the country to the north is Eteria, and to the west is Ethiopia, and then Somalia farther south. Uh, but this is a, a strait, which is very narrow, and it separates the Red Sea from the, uh, from the Arabian Sea, in effect. And uh, you've got Djibouti on one side, and you've got Yemen on the other, uh, which we know has been an area of conflict. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so China was building, I uh, quickly built not only military base where they were having uh, maneuvers, including live fire maneuvers. Uh, it also became a naval base for them. So here we are uh, four years after, four or five years after they started it. So that's a very unique situation. So why is the US there? Why is China there? Uh, and the Chinese certainly want to, uh, from a security standpoint, make sure that oil that comes through there or foodstuffs or manufactured goods that they send can pass through that strait. So Suez, uh, is not the only 
choke point in the neighborhood. So, so let me get my geography straight on this. This is be between Africa, the Horn of Africa, and Yemen. Um, and is it is it a choke point to um, get to the Suez Canal? Uh, in other it words, is. Can, can I get to the Suez Canal without passing through Bab el Mandab? No, you have to go through that strait, and that's you know a natural strait. We talk about canals, but of course there are natural straits, and so that's a natural strait. And very, very, very narrow there. I think it's, um, oh, I think 18 miles wide at one point. So who would you say is in control now? Well, the, you know, um, anyone can go through. There's nothing charged to go through. It's a natural waterway. But, you know, I think the U.S., you know, wants to exert some uh, uh, control and, uh, uh, protective approaches uh, for the Suez Canal, probably, and the, yeah. but the Chinese there have have goods going each way. Yeah, and the uh, the Chinese want to have a presence there because this is, uh, I'm guessing here. Please confirm um, because they have a large presence, a growing presence in Africa, and is part of their One Belt One Road initiative. Uh, they need to get to Africa, and I'm thinking that maybe the Strait of uh, Bab el Mandab has, has has something to do with their access to Africa. Oh, I, I'm sure that it does. You know, it was same for the U.S. gives you uh, a base to operate from, and the, as I think, as I said, the U.S. has five thousand troops there, at least of what they'll admit to. So, um, but uh, as to you know who controls things. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who is uh, Andre Portinov he is the director general of something called the Russian International Affairs Council. He wrote an article about a month ago that appeared uh, in, in a, uh, something called Global Brief, which is kind of like foreign affairs in a way, if you, uh, although that's basically US orientation. There's a lot of different writers. Mm -hmm. But Andre called for a new global govern governance of these canals and of these waterways, that something needs to be done under the aegis of the UN. And he even um, cited remarks by a US admiral uh, to that same effect, that something needed to be done. We just can't leave the, the, the defense and the protection to ad hoc and to you know, the countries that happen to be there. There should be global governance. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. It also sounds like you agree with it. But my question is uh, just how, how do you effectuate that? Because the people who control these canals uh, for a number of reasons, geopolitical and for that matter, financial, are not about to give them up. Well, that, that is absolutely correct. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so you've got to get it, get a dialogue going. And again, an incident, an unfortunate incident, as happened in Suez, could prompt that. But probably the only institution that you can move that through would be the United Nations. But I, I think you're, you're correct on that. Now, you have another uh, area that we want to talk about for sure, because it's... Um, Due, due southwest of Hawaii, and that's the Strait of Malacca, which is 580 miles long. And um, basically you've got the island of Sumatra, which is Indonesia on one side, and you've got the Malay Peninsula on the other side. And there's uh, several points where it's not too deep. You can still get some of these uh, ships through. In fact, um, there is actually a convention um, that's named after the strait that determines what size ships can go through. That's just from a navigation point of view. Mm -hmm. So again, Malay Peninsula and uh, Indonesia on the other side. Um, and there's contention around that strait, not by those two countries, but by India and China. Again, it's crucial for India to move manufactured goods through that strait. I mean, the only way to go from uh, the South China Sea 
and related bodies of water to the east of that area is through the Strait of Malacca. And that brings them out into the Indian Ocean. Well, guess who's waiting for them and has been waiting for them is the Indian Navy uh, right at the mouth of the Strait. And they did some uh, nice intimidation here a few months ago because there's a conflict, a land conflict in the Himalayas between China and India. And they were just signaling to the Chinese, you give us a hard time in the mountains and we're gonna stop your, the ships coming through. So- um, Very interesting. It's, it's thousands of miles it away. And yet uh, from a geopolitical point of view, it could be across the street. <laughs> right, and, uh, and of course the other thing is to get to the Malacca Strait, you've got to go through the Singapore Strait, which is only about 58 miles or so. <clears throat> But uh, going from the South China Sea to the Singapore Strait, which uh, Singapore would have some something to say about that, then up through the Malacca Strait. So that's so, another one of that's uh, a choke point. Yeah, right. Uh, so Asian Asian uh, maritime traffic is going to go through there to get to Europe, I suppose, uh, carrying all manner of things. Um, one one issue that comes to mind, you said it was shallow in some places, so what was 500 miles long. Um, and I wonder if there's a concern in this strait and other straits that are bottlenecks uh, for ships that that go go aground, uh, for ships that get in the way and stand in the way of other traffic later, uh, and whether that is the reason to have a, a, a you know an agreement among nations uh, to control the way ships move and whether it's a risk to international traffic. Well, I, without being complacent, uh, you know, the fact is that uh, the maritime industry, you know, has been uh, managing things pretty well. Uh, this was one of the very rare instances. I mean, when you think of the thousands of ships that go through these straits or these canals, this is a very low incidence, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you really get down to it. Probably the, the more concerning issue is state actors and non-state actors or terrorists who could do something and maybe not just hit one um, passageway, but two or three at the same time and convulse, you know, and truly convulse the world economy. I mean, if uh, these chips, uh, ships were uh, blown up or destroyed or wrecked, I mean, this ship just had to be moved off the bank. <laughs> they had to refloat it uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I do think some uh, more uh, proactive governance is needed. And then of course that quickly leads to how do you enforce, monitor, or supervise uh, what you're trying to govern and who gets to do that? And that's where you even more so intrude on sovereignty. Yeah, one and one. What well, you mentioned, non-state actors, um, and um, you know, terrorists are non-state actors, but so are pirates. And I wonder if uh, that's a concern in these choke points. That has been a concern in all of the cho choke points that we have talked about. Definitely has been piracy has been an issue, but with the collective action, it's been reduced tremendously. So I mean, the, this piracy occurred. And um, it was pretty much put down. I mean, the, the uh, Somali pirates, which are not not far from uh, the Strait and the Canal, uh, they were put down. And then the same, there were pirates in Malacca as well. So, but uh, someone had to take the initiative, and there was, uh, you know, some disruption. You know, speaking of uh, choke points, Bill, uh, you were talking about the South China Sea. And um, those, um, I, don't, I want to say artificial islands, those constructed islands, constructed islands and, and constructed into military operational units uh, by China in the South China Sea. And I wonder, and of course, they're there for strategic re reasons. They're there, I think you could say they're there to create choke points. Uh, would you agree with me about that? Are they uh, effectively choke points you know, that are created by China? There's no question about it. I mean, well, there may be um, a lot of water between some of them, but they give them a strategic presence. And it's also projecting power. 
That's really what it's about, projecting power to Vietnam, the Philippines, and even Australia. So they're asserting a presence there and saying who can go through it and who can't. And they don't like the fact that the Indians have very much so intruded into, that, though, into those waters. But India, of course, has business with Japan and Korea. So um, they don't want to be intimidated by the Chinese. And, and the Chinese have been very um, demanding, but very uh, possessive, if you will. I don't know if that's the right term about their ability to build these islands. And in fact, that uh, they were in a court case with the Philippines and others um, <clears throat> on whether they had a right to do that. Um, and uh, they, they lost. They lost in the international court in the Hague, but they don't care. They don't and, paid and, no attention. Yeah. And all, all of this is based on some legendary, almost mythic fleet that left from China in the 1500s and touched certain waters. So they're making the claims based on that. Yeah. But can we talk a little about the Panama Canal that's closer to home? And uh, I've always wondered, uh, I'd be interested in your thought about it, whether we really should have given it up. Mm. Well, um, that's, I uh, forget what, I, re I remember when that happened and uh, it was quite controversial at the time. And people probably don't even know or recall that there was a, a band of land five miles on each side of the canal. Uh, it was called the Canal Zone. And it even issued stamps. Um, and John McCain was born there. There was a question when he was running for president <laughs> in, in 2008, whether he was a, a natural born citizen of the United <laughs> States. Uh, Congress did pass a resolution to clear up that issue. Um, well, I mean, you know, from a, a geopolitical standpoint, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt may have been right. Uh, I'm not so sure what uh, was gained, certainly not gained by the United States. I think that it's been uh, well administered. Again, they did expand the canal. And uh, so that's something. There haven't been any issues there, really. But it's really very, very small. Um, it's, it's not wide enough. It's very, very narrow. Um, more recently, there has been a proposal, I think, by Nicaragua to uh, build a canal, which would be longer through the land than crossing a lake. And of course, when you go back to the history of the Panama Canal itself, the, uh, while the, uh, the, uh, the French were working that way, uh, there was a much stronger case made in Congress to go through Nicaragua, which was am amenable to the transit and to the canal versus Panama. But, you know, Panama appeared as the, uh, the narrowest place to do it. And you're know, speaking of geography, a lot of people don't realize that the, let's call it the Atlantic or the um, Caribbean end of the canal is actually farther to the west than the Pacific exit of the canal. If you can visualize that, if you really look at a north-south map, it has that difference to it. And I did drive across the isthmus a few years ago, which was a, a quite a, a weird thing to do because they had no signs uh, to get over to the other side. People go through on ships on a nice trip. I tried to drive over there to see the locks. I did get over there, but I got lost about three times trying to find my way. <laughs> How interesting. You talk about locks in the Panama Canal, which makes it a uh... You know, some there's a vulnerability there uh, to the extent that Suez. Was, That's a very good point. You know, uh, whereas actually the Suez is a straight cut through, which yeah. um, and they couldn't do with Panama, but uh, it seems to have been well administered, and they, they they did you know do themselves a favor by making it bigger. Well, I think for me, uh, you know, a takeaway here is uh, that article you mentioned. Um, about you know creating a, a United Nations body that would oversee all of these choke points, because as time goes by, um, you know even though we have better technology at sea and these ships are, you know more more uh, able to deal with um, you know casualties, 
or possible casualties. Uh, fact is that we're going to have more situations where quarter mile ships are stuck uh, and it affects our, our global supply chain and thus, you know, hundreds of countries and millions of people. And um, I would, I guess, uh, I guess the, 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 the takeaway point for me is we really need to do that before it becomes a, a, an international crisis, whether by natural, you know, unintentional causes or by intentional causes. One of these days, that could be something that, that, that burns the whole world. Right. Uh, no question. Especially as I say in my research on this, I was a little surprised to find out uh, the amount of food that's going through. And that is of greater tonnage and value than what we assume is the crude oil and LNG. So, uh, well, yeah. I guess we have to write our congressman. Yeah, we do. You know, it's, it's <laughs> interesting. There, as the world gets flatter, like Tom Friedman says, you know, these issues are revealed and uh, right. they become right. more critical for us. Right. And we have to pay attention. However, you know, the, it's a matter of priorities. You know, this particular issue is not a high priority in the United, right. United right. States or anywhere else. And we have to make it a high priority. Well, the terrorism is a high priority. And I think that's where various disparate nations, you know, can work together. So let's hope that they will do that. But um, thank you, Jay, very much for bringing out this issue and giving me the opportunity to talk about it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. It's been, it's been really elucidating and valuable to have this conversation with you. Um, your knowledge and uh, your experience in the area is impressive. And this discussion really takes me to a new place and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Aloha.